Hello and welcome to our fifth Gardening Australia special for this year. And this one is about our extraordinary and diverse landscapes. Australia may only cover a relatively small area of the globe, but we have more than 600,000 species of plants and animals. And over 80% of those are found nowhere else on Earth, which makes Australia a pretty special place. A place packed with biological diversity, and therefore a place worthy of protection. So in this special, we're looking at some of our landscapes and ecosystems that are under threat. We're gonna find out how this has come about, but most importantly, we're gonna look at some of the amazing work that's being done to protect, conserve and restore the precious biodiversity of our remarkable continent. To that end, Josh will be in Southwest WA with an inspiring story to find out about a large scale project that's helping to ensure the ecological future of the region. I'm on an island off the south coast of New South Wales where hundreds and thousands of visitors turn up each year. And Jane will be visiting a huge conservation project in Victoria. But first up in our special, let's join Jerry for a look at the big picture. Professor David Lindenmeyer is a conservation ecologist at the Australian National University. By any yardstick, Australia is an incredibly wealthy country. We have enormous mineral wealth, enormous other natural wealth, and Australians have really benefited from that. What hasn't benefited is the biodiversity. And it's really important that we turn that around because essentially the status of biodiversity is an indicator of the sustainability of our industries, whether it's fishing, whether it's forestry, whether it's farming. So by any yardstick with the number of extinctions and the number of declining species in this country, a lot of management is demonstrably unsustainable. So a classic example would be from our 30 years of work in the forests of Victoria, where we can see that the state's faunal emblem, Leadbeater's possum, is in a distinct extinction trajectory. So that clearly tells us that we have to make major changes to the way that we manage forests in that state. And can you give us an example of where things are going right? A positive sign comes from the temperate woodland environments that we're in right now here in southeastern New South Wales. We've seen a very significant improvement in biodiversity in these farmland environments in the last 10 years. And that shows us that the interventions, the planting, the fencing, the stock control can have major positive benefits, not only for plants and animals, but also for farm outputs. But it doesn't just happen on its own, does it? That's correct. It needs good science. We have the knowledge, we have the skills. We just simply need to do the investment to make sure that we can push this forward. Absolutely critical to the future of biodiversity, the future of sustainability, and the future of Australia. And we'll catch up with Jerry and David a little later in the show to see what's being done to help our threatened landscapes. Now, check out this stunning place. It's Montague Island, a historic lighthouse settlement and nature reserve, a couple of kilometres off the south coast of New South Wales. Formed of volcanic granite and basalt, the natural vegetation is coastal, clumping lamandra, grasses, westringa, coria and other low growers that have evolved to cope with shallow soils and exposure. In area, the island's really quite small, but its position helps it punch above its weight when it comes to ecology. You see, it's a critical stopping off point for the thousands of migratory birds, seals and penguins that pass this way every year. And this is where the problems begin. You'll probably recognise it. In fact, some of you probably have it as your lawn. It's kaikuyu grass and it's absolutely smothering these lamandra plants. In fact, it's as tall as me and they will die in due course. But the other problem is that it's having a devastating impact on the bird life here. So virtually this area along here, you can see all the penguin tracks. They've tried to get through the Kaikuyu and that's where your entanglement happens. You can see we even have trouble stepping it's through. Thick. 
Ian Andreessen is a field officer with the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service. I think one of the biggest impacts is, is when the birds get totally entangled in the grass because it covers their burrows, their ancestral birds, so they come back to the same hole every year. So a little bit of grass like this can really damage... Oh, it can impair generations for the simple reason, if you could imagine if that turns around a bird's foot, like that, it creates a tourniquet situation, just like with us. That foot then would be, if they'd lose that foot because of it, that is the bird's rudder, so that impedes the feeding, so therefore the feeding of generations to come. The island was suffering extreme erosion caused by overgrazing of rabbits and goats. So Kaikuyu was introduced with the best of intentions to halt the erosion and restore some ecological balance. However, the Kaikuyu was so successful that at one stage it covered half the island. Bird populations went into a nosedive and New South Wales National Parks sprang into action. After trialling a few different methods, they found a combination of spraying and then replanting native vegetation to be the most effective. And what sort of success is it bringing in real terms? I think in real terms there's a direct correlation between bird numbers and the reduction of Kaikuyu. So when Kaikuyu was at height, birds were at their lowest. Now Kaikuyu is being reduced, there is definitely a growth in bird numbers. This area here on my left is a great example of successful regeneration after about three years. We've got ground cover of Lamandra next to and interspersed in amongst this dense Westringer. And then above that, we've got the Casuarina providing a perfect windbreak. It really is the creation of a garden habitat for all the bird life. So down here we've got a nest box with a couple of little penguins. Oh yeah. Yeah, they're pretty cute. As you can imagine, this is the ideal environment for scientific research and PhD student Gemma Carroll has a particular interest in Montague's penguin population. So this is Dad and we've got two little chicks. So when the penguin chicks are about between zero and two weeks of age, the parent stays and guards them. So we call this the guard stage. So Mum's out today. She'll be swimming somewhere between um, up to about 20 kilometres from the island, um, getting, getting little pilchards probably. Um, she'll bring those back and feed the chicks tonight. So how are the numbers going on the island? Well, numbers in general uh, around the country are declining. But on Montague Island, because they've, they've done um, such a great work with the revegetation, getting rid of the kaikuyu, putting in these nest boxes to provide safe breeding places for the birds while they've done the burning and the revegetation, um, numbers on the island are increasing quite well. The thought that controlling one invasive species can help this beautiful little bird is something that makes all the work being done here worthwhile. We're heading over to Victoria now, where Jane's finding out how a variety of plants and animals are being brought back to an old sheep station on the banks of the mighty Murray. Ned's Corner is an historic sheep station in far northwestern Victoria, established back in 1869. It's a 30,000 hectare property that's surrounded by National Park and along its northern boundary, Murray River and the New South Wales border. What was it like in its heyday? Was it sort of rich and really going place? Yeah, it was a very busy place, being so big. Had lots of outstations with stock everywhere, so yeah, big property. Former sheep farmer Peter Barnes and his wife Colleen are the property's hard-working managers. It would have always been marginal type country for stock. Over the years, the grazing has made a large impact on the country, so it's it's sort of degraded it substantially and the grazing pressures wasn't only stock, it was rabbits had a lot to do with it as well. 
Over the past 10 years or so, Ned's Corner has been transformed into the largest conservation property in the state. Because in 2002, the property was purchased by Trust for Nature, a not-for-profit organisation that protects biodiversity on private land by enacting conservation covenants. All right. Wow, have a look at that fence. Ah, oh, goodness. Yeah, it's a great fence. Isn't it? Yeah. It's like the Great Wall of China kind of thing. <laughs> well, why did you put so much effort into that? Well, initially it was built to protect sensitive Indigenous cultural sites within, mm. and we built it to, as a dual purpose fence, so it's now predator proof, um, which keeps the rabbits and any grazing pressures out of the paddock. So it just gives it a spell from any grazing. Well, the actual ground is mainly filled up with your things like the salt bushes, aren't they? It is, yes. The, the, there's about, I think, seven different varieties of salt bush on Ned's Corner, ranging from the lower um, sort of annuals mm. to the the more permanent, like old man salt bush. Oh, the bigger stuff over there. Yes. This particular part of the paddock, we have the little um, rusty greenhood orchid, which is the only place on the property that it exists. It's just about due to flower. Um, we've actually got three that we know of on the property when you think of 73,000 acres and we've got three orchids. This is a different habitat, but it's still surrounded by that um, predator-proof fence. This has been here fenced off for uh, just over five years mm. now. And you can already see the grasses coming back. This was as bare as the um, the road we're walking on, believe oh, really? it or not. So it was a blowing red sand dune. Look at that, just straight sand dune. You imagine that blowing, so it's gone in, transformed in five years from, from just blowing to totally covered. We've planted three and a half thousand uh, native plants, mostly pines. So you can see from the really old to the young, there's nothing in between. So that's what the grazing pressure stopped, the natural regeneration of these trees. We're now in the black box country. And that means we're closer to the Murray River. Yes, down on the, the higher floodplain area, which is a grey clay type of country. And these are grand old trees, aren't they? They are. They Some of these are a bit smaller because they've been used in the earlier days for uh, cutting wood for the paddle boats. Oh. So you can tell by the um, cut off pieces. So. Woodcutters would have been employed okay. to cut and bring it into the paddle fuel. steamers. Oh, yes. good heavens. And I noticed some beautiful um, Eremophilas dotted around. Yes, the Eremophila maculatas. They, um, over the last three years and with the good seasons, they've uh, germinated all through this area, uh, literally hundreds of them. So ah. that's taking the grazing pressure off them again. They're it's an amazing just, plant. Aren't they? They're just oh, beautiful. Yeah, they really flowers. are. The flowers are gorgeous. Restoring a property as extensive as Ned's Corner to its former glory is a massive undertaking. But Peter and Colleen are convinced that their efforts are vital for the future. We take a lot of pride in what we call our baby trees. Um, the, uh, we, we see them every day, so we see them growing. Uh, we're seeing the sand hills cover up. It, and one of the best parts of the job is taking people around and showing them um, what is happening to the property. And it, it's great just to be able to restore native vegetation to a very degraded countryside, back to, you know, bring it back to its natural state. So, yeah, very exciting. From Victoria, we're heading to Southwest WA, where Josh is finding out about a project that's being undertaken on a massive scale. I reckon this is one of the most beautiful places in the country, the town of Albany in the great southern region of WA, about 400 k's from Perth. 
It's an area known for magical coastlines and vast areas of cropping land, as well as vineyards and grazing sheep and cattle. For me, the jewel on the crown is the breathtaking natural bushland, and that's what my journey down here is all about. G'day Simon, Josh Byrne. G'day Josh. How are you? Nice to meet you. Good. Welcome to the South Coast. Thank you. I believe you've got to show me around today. Yeah, just going to have a look see Great. you. Great. Looking forward to it. Simon Smale describes himself as a restorationist and he's part of a network of people and organisations that are working to protect and reconnect one of the most important biodiversity hotspots in the world. The vast southwestern Australia. The project is called the Gondwana Link and for the last 10 years it's been working towards the goal of having 1,000 kilometres of re-established and reconnected bush. So this is the whole Gondwana Lynx bush here. Amazing. And this is the Stirling Range National Park That's here. It. And okay. we're, we're right about there, towards the um, eastern end of Stirling Range. But the That's overall it. project goes from here That's in the Margaret deal. River, That's right it. the way through to the western woodlands. Defiantly ambitious. Whew, you've got some work to do. <laughs> we, but it's going to keep us out of mischief for a while, isn't Amazing. it? Amazing. Sitting across these vast landscapes are a multitude of plant species and we're lucky enough to visit at a time of year when lots are in flower, including eucalyptus, leptospermum and gastrolobium species. It's estimated that around 10 to 15 per cent of the plant species in this particular region are unknown to science. And it's alarming to learn that in the last 50 years, about 80 per cent of the area's original vegetation has been removed through land clearing. The traditional approach to conservation management just isn't doing it for us in terms of arresting biodiversity decline. So we've been managing effectively isolated islands of habitat all over the place and, and doing the best job we possibly can do inside those, um, but just continuing to manage ongoing decline. The idea came about that, well, maybe we actually need to be managing at landscape scale rather than just managing these, these fragments that we've got left. And what value comes from reconnecting these fragmented patches of remnant vegetation? Fauna movement is the most obvious one. You know, some fauna actually need continuous connected corridors of vegetation to move through. And if they haven't got that, then a whole lot of aspects of population dynamics, you know, the need for interbreeding at a larger landscape scale can no longer occur. So that contributes to decline in that species. But then there are less obvious things like the evolution of the flora here and the fact that that's been an ongoing continuous process for millions and millions of years. And if you actually truncate that by generating hostile landscape between the fragments you've got left, ongoing evolution is also truncated. Now, of course, we've got climate change. So communities are shifting their location in the landscape in response to you know, a drying or a wetting or a warmer or, or a cooling climate. So I would say those are the three key reasons for be behind connectivity. A project like this requires teamwork and restoration on this scale requires specialist tools. The design of this custom-made machine was inspired by farming equipment and enables a mix of native seeds to be sown across large areas with great success. This is certainly gardening on a, on a grand scale, Peter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. It is now. Uh, in the early days we were, you know, scattering seed by hand, but um, considering the, the, the areas we've got to seed, machines like this make it a breeze. Peter Luscombe is an expert in native seed collection and has dedicated much of his life to bush restoration. His 300 hectare property, Caledonia Hill, is a mix of natural bush and cleared land. Countless hours of rear vegetation work is bringing the landscape back to life. How long from seeding until germination? Uh, it depending on the weather. Uh, anything up to a month uh, for most species. Some seeds won't even germinate until the following season. When uh, th this work is done, there, there are uh, weed weedicides go on and uh, insecticides go on to prepare the soil to make sure that the seeds have got every possibility of surviving. And then afterwards we have to protect the area from rabbits. Definitely a lot of follow-up work. We're never going to be able to restore back to what once was. One of the really encouraging things is we've been, we're actually surprised how fast you get those habitat values um, being recreated in the landscape. It's, it's incredibly rewarding work. 
It's a real privilege to walk through beautiful bushland like this, and it certainly gives us something to aspire to in terms of repairing the damaged landscapes that land clearing has caused. Now, it'd be easy to get overwhelmed by something that is the scale of the Gondwana Link project, but what I've discovered in my time here is that its success will come down to the ongoing commitment of the people involved. Let's catch up again with Jerry and David Lindemeyer, who are on the road to Gundagai. This 1,600 hectare beef and sheep property is a few kilometres south of the Gundagai township. It's been in Sam Archer's family for generations. He's one of hundreds of farmers that David has worked with over the years. We're driven by two things, increasing biodiversity and increasing productivity, which, which affects profitability. And the more we embark on this journey, the more we see the two blur and come together. But if we reflect back on what the property looked like previously, we saw degradation, there was salinity, we had um, erosion, a lot of weeds, and as a result of that, a decline in, in biodiversity and similarly a decline in profitability and productivity. Um, what are the positive signs now? What we're seeing is uh, a massive increase in uh, remnant vegetation. We're seeing native perennial pastures come back into the landscape that are highly adapted. Consequently, we're less reliant on inputs, be it fertiliser or sprays and what have you. And this is a journey that both of you have been involved in. Absolutely. We do the science that follows the interventions that Sam does on the farm and we can see the response of biodiversity and we can see the response in terms of how the system's performing. I'm keen to see some more. Come on, Gruffitt. So what we're looking at here is a major problem in agriculture, isn't it? Absolutely. So what happens is that when the trees are cleared, the water can rise up through the soil, and as it does that, it brings salt with it, and eventually you get salt scalds and salinity at the surface, and that kills off the remaining trees. So what's the solution? How do we repair the land? So what we need to do then is to start to put trees back into the landscape to help pump the water table down and address this problem of salinity. And so Sam has been a model farmer here through planting block plantings up on the hill and then strip plantings and starting to put the system back to where it needs to be to be sustainable. Overgrazing is a perennial agricultural problem, but here it's been largely overcome. So in the past, we used to have very large paddocks of about 160 hectares that would connect down from the hilltops down to the flats. And those paddocks would be heavily overgrazed and you'd end up with a heavily degraded farm. So what Sam's done here in a very elegant way is to create many smaller paddocks. Stock are moved regularly from paddock to paddock to paddock. Paddocks have got much more time to recover and the system is managed in a much more sustainable way. Protecting the higher ground from overgrazing has paid dividends. Fantastic. So people like Mason are part of our field team and also local farmers. Been working here for many, many years. And these rocky outcrops are important biodiversity hotspots for reptiles. And when we have sustainably managed farms, we have good populations of reptiles, we have good populations of other animals that eat reptiles, that's a, a good sign for sustainable farming management. Now I know this grass, this is an Australian native, it's Microlina stipoides. I use this at Sydney Botanic Gardens as a no-mow grass on steep slopes that were too dangerous to mow. It seems to have formed a wonderful pasture here and the Cape Weed and the Patterson's Curse are struggling. We've excluded stock for three years and have seen an explosion of these grasses. Is this sown? No, not at all. No, we've, really? We've just uh, managed the landscape to recruit it back in and allowed it to flower and set seed at the opportune times of the year. And for us, this has enabled us to double our carrying capacity on this hill and, and similar hills. It's uh, highly digestible, highly adapted to this landscape, acidic soils, saline soils, drought. It doesn't need fertiliser, so it just does it all on its own. This farm has a permanent creek 
and Sam's making the most of it. So, Jerry, what we've seen here is this part of the creek used to just flow like a storm water drain. As soon as we had a rainfall event, it just whooshed straight through. But by planting native trees and shrubs into it, it's gradually pulled up and it moves through much more slowly. We've excluded stock and as a result, the nutrient load and the erosion has been significantly reduced. The important thing here too is that the scientific evidence shows that the water quality has increased dramatically and that's good for stock, but also it's very important for biodiversity. With David's collaboration, Sam Archer has done a magnificent job of revitalising the family farm. It is more sustainable in every way. It's wonderful the way everything here seems to just work. It is. And at the end of the day, protect the environment and it protects you. Destroy the environment and you don't eat. Damn right. Well, that's it for our final special for the year. And I hope we've inspired you to learn more about your local mix of plants and animals and to get involved with protecting them. Now, I'm sad to say that next week's program is our last for the year, but we'll be in celebration mode. I like to apply. Josh will be looking back at his amazing year and celebrating his new garden with the family. Jane meets the designer of the winning garden at the Chelsea Flower Show to find out where his inspiration came from. And Sophie drops in on the winner of the Gardening Australia Gardener of the Year competition. It's going to be a fantastic finale to what's been a great year. I'll see you then. Hi, Josh Byrne here. If you've missed an episode of Gardening Australia, you can catch it on ABC iView or go to our website. How good's that?